thank you everybody. I'm really excited to see such a full room here today to hear us talking about patient keeping patient healthcare data secure on Google Cloud Platform. I'm Joe Corkery. I'm a product manager on the Cloud Platform team where I'm leading our efforts in the healthcare and life sciences space in the product world. Uh, I'm very excited about this particular topic. It's near and dear to me. Uh, actually uh, a non-practicing physician and uh, found my way to Google and uh, really excited to talk to you about this. Here's a bit of an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to start off by talking about HIPAA compliance on GCP, what that means, and then I'm going to transition into best practices for securing healthcare data on the cloud, how you should configure your cloud environment to, have, to take advantage of the best practices. At that point, I'm going to transition and invite uh, my co-presenter, Michael Ames, on stage. And he's going to talk about the work they've done at the University of Colorado, how they were able to build the healthcare uh, EDW on the cloud, and hopefully give a, give a brief demo of that as well. And then finally, because I know Google Cloud encompasses more than just Google Cloud Platform, I'm going to touch very briefly on G Suite and healthcare as well. Let's get started. I don't know if all of you have seen this, but uh, we published this uh, right the week before HIMSS, a, a new guide for HIPAA compliance on GCP to help people understand what that means, as well as to understand uh, best practices for configuration. So if you miss anything today, you can either watch this again on YouTube, or you can go read that document, because most of what I'm going to talk about is also captured in there. So by virtue of this being a talk about healthcare, I'm going to assume most people here know what HIPAA is. But in case you're not aware of it, it's US legislation that provides data privacy and security provisions for the handling of medical information. Importantly, there is no certification recognized by the Department of Health and Human Services for HIPAA compliance. And what that means is I can't go out and you can't go out to some third party and get a nice certificate that says this is HIPAA compliant and bring that around to everybody. So your HIPAA compliance is really a shared responsibility on your, well, it's a responsibility on your part. And when you're working with the cloud provider, it's a shared responsibility between you and the cloud provider. What that means is customers are responsible for securing their data and the content that they bring to the cloud. And Google is responsible for securing the infrastructure on which that data is stored, analyzed, and consumed. This is a high-level diagram of the spectrum of the shared responsibility model across SaaS, PaaS, infrastructure as a service. And as you go from the SaaS environment all the way down to the IS environment, the ratio of responsibility changes. So when you look at a SaaS model like uh, Gmail or Drive, ultimately the customer is responsible for the data and who has access to the data, but Google has much greater responsibility on securing everything underneath it. But as you move to the IS model, Google has a responsibility for securing the infrastructure, but you as the consumer are responsible for the operating system that you install on top of it, how you configure your firewalls and beyond. I'm going to talk about these terms a fair bit in the talk, so I'm just going to, you know, quickly define them in case anybody is not familiar with them. Protected health information is really health information that includes demographic info as well as information that refers to past, present, and future medical information, uh, as well as the provision of that uh, health care, and finally also the billing of that. A covered entity is one of really three things. It's either a health plan, so an insurance provider, or a healthcare provider, so a doctor, physician, nurse, or hospital system, as well as, or a healthcare clearinghouse. And finally, a business associate, and this is a, a business associate is an institution or a person who works with a covered entity, does work on their behalf, and as part of that work, protected health information is disclosed. And in order for a covered entity and a business associate to work together, they have to execute a business associate agreement that governs how that transfer of data is going to be managed and controlled. 
So this is an important point I want to you know, kind of sell home, because I feel like not everybody is well aware of this, but Google will enter into a business associate agreement with customers as necessary uh, under HIPAA. So in this context, you know, if you're a hospital system, you're the covered entity, Google's the business associate, and we will sign that agreement so that you can bring protected health information to the cloud. And we're able to sign this because of our approach to security and privacy design. The cloud platform was built under the guidance of an engineering team of more than 700 security, uh, over a 700 person security engineering team, which is larger and most likely significantly larger than what most people can have on premise. And furthermore, our, our approach to security, privacy, data protection is well documented in a number of white papers. Uh, design overviews that you can go to this website, our security page, and view. In fact, earlier in January, we published a well-documented security design. I would highly encourage you to go review this. It's really quite detailed. Uh, and then share it with anybody in your organization who you think really needs to understand the security practices that Google brings to bear in the cloud. We're really excited about this. It got well over 50,000 views in the first couple of days. It's worth looking, it's worth sharing with your, uh, anybody who has an interest in that. But it's all, it's all well and good that we actually perform uh, these security practices and that we document them, but we also, you, you know, as customers, also want to verify that, to validate it. And so as part of that, we participate in a number of external third-party audits on an annual basis to get you know, SOC 2 compliance, ISO 27001, 27017, so on. So that way you can know that somebody else has gone in and verified the, the designs and the practices that we say. As I mentioned before, there is no certifying party for HIPAA compliance, so I can't put that, uh, you know, on that list over there. But it's because of these compliance audits that we go through, as well as our own um, security and privacy designs, that we're we feel comfortable being able to offer a business associates agreement. The business associates agreement covers a number of things. In particular, it covers the infrastructure, all regions, zones, network paths, points, and presence for these related services that are listed here. Listed here. There are 10 services right now uh, it's grown significantly over the past year or two and will continue to grow over time. And when you sign the business associate agreement, it covers your utilization of these products. There are a couple really unique, interesting features, though, as uh, a result of our uh, security practices uh, feeding into our BAA. And what, because the BAA covers the infrastructure underlying these products, and not just a secured set of infrastructure to run just that in a HIPAA compliant fashion, it means you don't have any regional restrictions. So you get security, operational, and scalability benefits of having access to the entire infrastructure. It means you can have multi-regional redundancy. So if, for instance, you're storing a lot of healthcare data in the cloud, you don't, have to be, you don't have to be limited to one data center. So you can store the data in GCS on the East Coast and on the West Coast, and if you have temporary unavailability, you can fail over from one to the other relatively easily. Furthermore, as part of this, you can use any of the VM instance types. So you can take advantage of preemptible VMs, which are very useful in terms of saving a lot of money for batch workloads where you're tolerant to the VM coming down and being able to easily restart it. With all that in mind, and because we don't have to actually build out and maintain a completely separate infrastructure stack in order to offer you a HIPAA compliant environment, we can offer the same pricing. There are no additional fees, charges, taxes, commitments that you have to make in order to uh, operate under the BAA. Let me talk a little bit now about some of the specific customer responsibilities. I have two questions that you really need to answer before we move on. And the first one is, you need to answer for yourself, are you a covered entity or a business associate of a covered entity? And then you also need to answer, does the workload that you want to bring to cloud require that you have a business associate agreement with GCP? I can't answer these questions for you. 
Hopefully, you, know, you already know these answers, and if you don't, I would encourage you to seek legal advice. Now, if you answered yes to both of those questions, this is, what's gonna, this, this is what needs to happen first. First thing you need to do is you need to execute a cloud platform BAA, and that's done in the context of a larger services agreement. And then when, for that environment that you're working in, you need to ensure that you can disable or otherwise ensure that you're not using Google Cloud products that are not explicitly covered by the BAA when you're handling PHI. And finally, and this goes back to that shared responsibility model, you need to ensure that anything that you build on top of this infrastructure also meets the HIPAA requirements. So any applications that you might install as well as your use of that uh, application. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, individual best practices. I'm going to start off with identity and access management. The first real principle to be aware of is this principle of least privilege. And this is the idea that nobody should be granted permissions beyond what they absolutely need to get their job done. So you should not be granting permissions to everybody in your organization to the data. You should not be giving everybody owner roles on the projects. Instead, what you should do is you should put the uh, work together in as small as projects as possible, grant specific roles to those individual projects, and only give people who have a business need for that those particular roles. As part of that, we encourage people to use groups. And what you can do is you can take groups and assign a permission to, the, to that group as opposed to assigning a permission to an individual user. And what that means is you can say, okay, this is our security admin group. And people in the security admin group have these permissions. And if I remove you from that group, you lose all those permissions. You don't have to go and you know, change your whole IAM policy for your project to remove you. It makes it very easy, especially with uh, people moving around. But part of that means you also need to tightly control who has the ability to change identities and policies. So you want tight configuration over who has user management, group management, and IAM policies. In addition to that, you also want to audit policy changes with some you know, frequency. In particular, you want to go and look and say, were the changes that were made appropriate? What you can see on the screen right now is a, a screenshot of the activity panel on the Cloud Console, which is showing you an IAM policy change. And this is, a, I'll talk a little bit more about auditing uh, in, the, in a little further on. And then this last bit with regard to IAM is we encourage people to uh, you know, rotate your service account keys, or if you're not going to actually do the rotation, to have a plan in place for how you're going to rotate those keys if you need to do that. And this is important because the service account key is what allows you to authenticate as that service account. So if that key gets lost, you want to be able to rotate it very quickly so nobody has access to that service account. Encryption. This is kind of an easy story for us here because all customer content is encrypted at rest on Google Cloud Platform. We're the only cloud platform to provide that by default. What I need you to ask yourself then is, does your organization have any other encryption requirements beyond what's required by HIPAA? And if you do, we have options for you. And they run along a spectrum from highly automated of the everything is encrypted by default to the more managed uh, key management service, as well as the ability to provide your own customer supplied encryption keys. I'm going to talk briefly about storage. So if you're using cloud storage, uh, we encourage people to use GCS object versioning because this is very useful for building a data archive as well as uh, protecting against accidental data deletion, which I know is often an important requirement when handling healthcare data. There's a tool that people use with cloud storage called GSUtil, and there are a couple security and privacy configuration things that you should be aware of there. First of all, you never want to share credentials. Everybody should bring their own credential when they use it. And that's important because sometimes uh, secure sensitive information can be captured in the configuration file for that application. And so you want to tightly protect access to that for whoever is using it. And more importantly, if you're going to use this in a production environment, use a service account credential instead of individual user credentials. It's easier to control. 
audit logs. So these are what allow you to know who did what, where, when on your platform. Very valuable, especially when you're working with health information. There are two types of audit logs. There's the admin activity log, which basically can capture, captures all the, cha you know, the, the, the actions that you take that make a change to a resource or your service. And then there's the data access log, which captures all the requests to read, as well as all the interactions with the data managed by that service. So if you were having a database service and actually touching the data, that's where those logs would be captured. I have a couple examples of you know, you know, typical operations as they would be classified one or the other. You can see up here right now, there are two ways that the audit logs get surfaced to, to the users. On one hand, you see the Cloud Activity Console, which provides you a high-level overview. Basically tells you what are the important points uh, and you know, makes it really easy for you to see. On the right is the raw log being able to be seen inside of Stackdriver Logging Logs Viewer. So if you want the full details to actually look at the individual logs, you can see them right there. Let's talk a little bit about some of the best practices for audit logs when you're working in this environment. What we encourage people to do is we encourage people to you know, first set up their export destinations. So you want to send your logs to another location for long-term archival. You can send them to GCS for long-term archival. You can also send them to BigQuery and use that for archival as well as forensics and analytics. I'm seeing a lot of interest in using BigQuery as a as a tool for log analysis. We also want you to configure access to the logs in a way that's appropriate to your organization. So as, as I said earlier on the topic of least privilege, you only want to give people who need to see the logs right to see the logs. And there are actually there are three permissions that you should be aware of. There's the logs viewer permission, and the logs viewer permission grants you access to the admin activity logs. There's the private logs viewer permission, which grants you access to the data access logs. And you know, we, we decided to give them an extra permission because we thought perhaps that, they, that data might be a little bit more sensitive and you might want to break out who could look at one versus the other. And then the final permission that you should be aware of is the, configure, uh, the logs config writer permission. And a person with the logs config writer permission is a person who can set up new export destinations. And this is a pretty powerful uh, permission because it allows you to take your logs out of here and send them somewhere else. So you should not, you know, the, the person with that permission should be, you know, very few. And finally, as I talked about earlier, you want to regularly review these audit logs and you can do them inside of Stackdriver Logs Viewer. You can do it inside of BigQuery or with a variety of third-party tools. So we support exporting your logs to other external destinations so you can take advantage of Splunk, Netscope, Rapid7 log entries, as well as Tenable Network Security to use those for log analysis. And this is my, my last topic on best practices before I hand it off to Michael. And this is what I, what I like to think is ideally a, you know, a common sense thought, but please don't include PHI or security credentials in your resource metadata. Resource metadata often gets captured in the logs, and you know, that's really not a good practice. So as I said, audit, and actually, I want to emphasize this. So the audit logs themselves never contain the contents or the data contents of a resource. But by virtue of capturing the actions that happened, they often may capture the metadata associated with that resource. So in best practices, don't name your buckets after your patients. Don't name your objects after your patients. Use you know, other identifiers. So with that, I, I want to uh, step down for a second and transition. Michael, please come on up. Thank you. All right. Healthcare people are the most dedicated people in the world. It is 4.30 PM. It's been a long day. This room is almost full. Thank you for being here. I hope that by the end it will be um, worth it. Now, I can't see you really well, but if you'll do this for me, raise your hand if right now your organization has protected health information on the Google Cloud today. Okay, now put your hand down if you work for me. 
Okay, now raise your hand if, if you would do it if you could, if you could get over the organizational and the security hurdles, if you could talk your people into, into saying, yeah, we can do this, put your hands up. Great, okay. This presentation is for you, and this is a great time to be a healthcare-related organization looking at a move to the cloud. And I'll tell you, part of why it's a great time is a year ago, I was here with my team, and my team is here, thank you. Um, I was here with my team and, and talking to, to everybody I could find from Google, other customers, and the leadership circle, saying, hey, where is, we're trying to get our, our PHI up onto the cloud and we want to do it right. Where's the HIPAA security playbook that's going to tell us how to do this in a way that's safe and secure and is going to protect patient privacy and keep us all out of jail? And, and everybody's like, yeah, that's a good idea, we should get one of those. Right? But it wasn't there. And we spent a lot of time on our own, working with our team, working with external partners, with Google, trying to figure out the right way to do it. And what Joe has just presented is that playbook that we wished had been here a year ago that isn't. And you have that now. So this is a great time to be um, embarking on that journey. And what I'm going to talk to you about is what our journey looked like, and then go back and talk specifically about um, some, some things that you might take back to try to win this battle for hearts and minds within your organization to allow you to take this step, move to the cloud, enjoy the technical benefits that we've been learning about here and do it in a safe and secure manner. So, part one, what we did. This is a little bit about us. Um, my organization is on the bottom of that right square there, Health Data Compass. We're an enterprise health data warehouse within a large organization, the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine. This is a great organization that was formed just recently, collaborative between UC Health, Children's Hospital Colorado, CU Medicine, and the University of Colorado School of Medicine, who got together and said, what could we do better than we're doing today if we put all of our data in one place? And specifically, what can we do to help to advance this field of personalized medicine? For those of you for whom that's a, a new term or a, or a, or a vague uh, uh, buzzword, for us what it means is let's gather as much data as we can about every patient at the clinical level. Let's then go in and gather everything we can learn about them from a molecular or a genetic standpoint. Let's put that together and analyze that data and see if we can figure out how to deliver targeted diagnoses and targeted therapies based on everything we can possibly learn about you not just the handful of questions that the doctor is asking when you show up at the bedside. So that's our job. And specifically within Health Data Compass, we are tasked with that integration of these vast amounts of data in a way that our researchers and hospital administrators can use it to serve a wide variety of purposes. I'm gonna give you a little bit of company history now. This is our affectionately named Compass Hope-O-Meter. Because we are data people, we like to put numbers to our emotions. And, uh, and you can see here, we kicked off in the summer of 2000, uh, 2013 with a pile of money and a huge mission. And as we began to work on this project, going through the, the stages of, of figuring out our requirements, developing an RFP, putting that RFP out there, I remember the day I still have the photo that we were able to finally look at these 20 thick binders with proposals from different vendors who were going to come help us solve our data integration project. We were so excited. And we, and we launched, we chose our vendor, we started to launch our building efforts in the summer of 2014 with high hopes. And then what happens? Right? Many of you have been through this cycle where once you get your hands on the technology and you start to work with it, you realize this is harder than we thought it was going to be. That sales pitch sounded so good, right? And, and now as we're working with it more and more, we're finding ourselves a little bit more disappointed. But we did, by the skin of our teeth, reach our go live in the spring of 2015. Now, notice how much time passed between our go live and our hopometer dropping to all time lows. About three months was all it took. We were having some trouble. We were drowning under the weight of maintaining what turned out to be a very heavy, very brittle, very error-prone on-premises infrastructure. Um, it was a top-to-bottom 
stack all of one brand, supposedly tightly integrated and was going to service all of our needs. And it was possible to achieve that, but only at tremendous effort and expense that to us felt like constantly having to go back and flip on a really heavy, really costly light switch. All it did was keep the system running and we were spending resources on those activities that we would much rather have spent on value-added activities for our stakeholders. We expected the server to blaze right out of the box. We had a lot of off-the-shelf software we expected was just gonna work. And what we had hoped was that by investing so heavily in what, what honestly was the most expensive of that big stack of binders and proposals, that, that we would be able to accelerate to business objectives. The reality is that wasn't the case, and, uh, and that, that presented us with a problem and was frankly um, quite depressing. And then we had an interesting day. So this is my good friend Marianne Leach, whom some of you may know. She's, uh, this is a, a great International Women's Week, another of these great um, visionary women leaders in healthcare whom we're celebrating. She was CIO of Children's Hospital at the time, and, uh, and she had this idea, she called me up, and she said, hey, I just got invited to a thing to go learn about the Google Cloud. Do you want to come? At which point I rolled my eyes, right? Because she's, she, she, she's, a, she's a visionary, she's a thinker, and the thing about visionary people with great ideas is they have a lot of ideas, they're not always good, right? And, and she was one of these, and I thought, oh, I, 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 I don't know, until she said it's at a fancy steakhouse. Uh, Google Legal made me redact the name of that steakhouse. <laughs> All right, but, but we went to a fancy steakhouse. And, uh, and I thought, uh, okay, I could be persuaded. Um, and so we got together and we went to this, uh, this Google Cloud sales pitch downtown, wherein we discovered that there was no steak. No steak at all, there were only canapes. Do I look like a guy who was happy to be served a piece of fish on a cracker when I thought there was steak? No, I am not that guy. But what we did do is we spent the day learning about the Google Cloud from Doug Daniels, who's here in the, in the second row, and um, he was talking about BigQuery. And he was talking about Google Genomics. And he was talking about this concept of operating on a completely serverless architecture. And think about where we were drowning under the weight of maintaining our servers. Um, our minds were blown, right? You like my classy diagrams here? So we started to think, well, this, this, this would be amazing. And, and where was this two years ago when we started? How come we didn't know about this then? And we realized as we considered this question about could we shift our operations to the cloud, that there were some things that had changed. In those couple of years, there were significant advances in cloud technology, there were new attitudes about cloud services. Where when I started at the university back in 2009, you talked about putting data in the cloud, they would laugh you out of the room. And, and people were starting to think about this as maybe a reality. We understood better the potential of the business case, and we, we had learned some things, and we thought, maybe we could do this. But I want to tell you a little bit about the challenge that we had to overcome. Like I showed in that first slide, there are four separate legal institutions involved in our organization. Two major hospital systems in Colorado, a university and a physician practice plan, which even though many of them have their roots in the university are literally now separate legal institutions, one does not operate the other. Each of them has their own security officer, privacy officer, legal officer. Uh, we have a steering committee consisting of the executives from all of those organizations. And put yourself in my shoes, going in front of this group of people and asking for a do-over, right? Just a few months after our go-live. But we felt like, given the experiences that we were having and our responsibility to our stakeholders and our patients, that we needed to take care of every opportunity that we could. So here's how we strategized this. We said, let's do with Google what we could not do with our original system. It took less than six months for us to realize that we were having serious problems. And we set out to do a detailed pilot project on the Google Cloud platform in six months, in stealth mode, not telling anybody who, did, who, who didn't need to know, while we continued to build out and operate our legacy system. Now, how is this possible? 
we're gonna talk in a little bit about zero depth entry and pay as you go models and how it enables this kind of thing where traditional models do not. Um, and and we, we, we laid out this plan and, and we executed this plan and we, we did it with the intent to answer these questions. We wanted to find out, is it compliant, legal, safe? Can we do everything we need to know? We literally built all of the components necessary to operate our data warehouse because we did not, I can ask for one do-over. I can ask for two, at which point I sharpen up my resume and I go find other jobs, right? We only had one chance to do this a second time. So we had to make sure that we were getting it right. We wanted to make sure that the capabilities were there and also measure costs and long-term benefits so that we could make a compelling case for why our organization should make this change. Which we did, and we built this in six months. So you can see here our data sources coming in from our hospital partners and from the Colorado Department of Public Health because we, one of the things that we wanted to prove was the effect of this, effectiveness of this platform in integrating data that came from sources other than our own. We load that data into the Google Cloud platform through Google Cloud Storage, Google Genomics, into Google BigQuery. We transform, we clean, we harmonize, we do all of the work there in the cloud. So again, follow me. For those of you who work in data flow architectures, we load the data as, as unchanged as possible into the cloud and we let the scalability of BigQuery be our friend in doing all of the transformations that are necessary, and then we deliver reports via Tableau. We have since continued to build, and we continue to have a vision of building out additional data sources. There's probably a list of 20 other data sources down there that we're working to integrate. In addition to these applications that we're exporting data to, uh, my outstanding analyst and BI team spends a lot of time delivering one-off data extracts to researchers, these, these people who stay up late at night and they come to us in the morning and, and they've got an idea for a research project and they just want to know, do we have the data? Do we have the popula patient population to support this? Very specific ad hoc questions. And they ask us those and we provide those to them based on this platform. So we built this thing and we measured the results. And here's some things that we found. On the left side is an ETL performance comparison. Now, it's tough to do apples to apples ETL comparison when you're dealing with on-premises systems versus systems that are sort of hybrid, moving from an on-premise system up into the cloud. But we figured the most honest way to do this is to look at end-to-end -end ETL. So we start with extracting data. On one end, we end with when it has reached its final destination up in the cloud, and as you can see there, we achieved a 50% performance improvement, even including the time that it took to upload that data through the internet from our campus up onto the cloud. And here is an, an outlier, but just to show you some of the things that are possible, and in fact, I'm gonna come back to this, but any of you operate a master patient index? Know what I'm talking about with that, a few of you? We had a big win there, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. When I show these costs, I'm always asked, and Google Legal asked, are there real numbers behind this? There are. Uh, these are our annual infrastructure costs. I'm not giving you the real numbers, but the ratio there is correct. You can see that having moved from our legacy system to Google BigQuery, we anticipate spending 60% less on annual, annual infrastructure costs, and we've operated this now for um, close to 10 months, and we have actual data to validate those numbers for us. Projecting that out over five years, you can see that year over year, uh, we experience reductions in cost and a cumulative total infrastructure reduction, again, of around 60%. And if I was being totally honest, that reduction would even be higher. Because you can see in fiscal year 20, that big red bar represents end-of-life equipment for our on-premises system and the need to replace that. If we were really doing it right, we actually would have done an expansion of our system in fiscal year 17, and that would drive that ratio even higher. So, we did this pilot. We got these great results. I want to back up now a little bit and talk about how you take on the battle for hearts and minds. 
so we have this committee. I told you about these four institutions and each of them has a security officer. Each of them has a privacy officer. Each of them has an attorney and once a month they literally get around a boardroom table that looks just like that for us to bring our questions to them. Now, Google Legal, uh, I normally present this slide with a bunch of cropped out pictures of Nancy Reagan's face. Think about it. Um, with all respect to our lovely and elegant uh, former first lady, um, we call this the Nancy Reagan Committee because the security officer, the privacy officer, the legal person all have just one job description, which is? Just say no, right? And we had to persuade this group of people that it was safe for all four of their institutions to have their data moved to the cloud. Here's how, here's how you go about this. Recognize that the risk that they're looking at is threefold. They're concerned about the cost because the cloud is unknown. They're very concerned about security because that's paramount. And in general, the cloud is unfamiliar. And these are the problems that you have to tackle. There is, in the end, only one thing that will make a difference, and that is the business case that proves that the rewards are gonna be greater than the risks. And you're gonna answer cost by demonstrating that there's gonna be increased revenue or cost savings by moving to the cloud. You're gonna answer security by saying, the security is going to be better when we get there. We will fulfill our responsibility to our patients more fully by taking advantage of those 700 security and compliance engineers that Joe talked about. And you're gonna answer concerns about the unknown with opportunities to innovate that you'll be able to take advantage in the cloud that you won't in other places. Here is part of a, a, a helpful way, I hope, of talking about cost versus value because in the end, the money aspect of this matters. So that blue area represents investment in infrastructure capacity, which has this stepwise function. That red line is, is your, your usage on that capacity, and let's just assume that it's going up kind of flat over time. You can twist and warp this model all you want, but it, it gives you the same results, more or less. A as you approach capacity, you need to expand upon your infrastructure, and you make a big investment, and you deploy out new servers, and then you do that again after some period later, and, and the thing that happens is the infrastructure that you had invested in that you're not using, that time between when you first make the purchase and when you start to reach capacity is considered waste. That's money that you've spent that you aren't using. And look how that adds up over time. That orange line shows how that wasted area accumulates. This has a dramatic effect on total cost of ownership. And the model, when you move to an infrastructure where you can scale up more closely to your usage, changes this significantly. So here's a pay-as-you-go model, only investing in the infrastructure that you need. With systems like, like BigQuery, that stepwise function is even flatter because you're literally only paying for queries as you execute them. But even if you're deploying virtual machines and you're able to sort of gradually uh, scale those out and build them up, we have the same usage, we have the same slope, but the mean is much lower, and look what happens to the accumulated waste. It is much, much smaller. This has a dramatic effect on your total cost of ownership, and in my opinion, is one of the strongest arguments for a move to the cloud from an economic point of view. I want to verify with our folks that this clock is counting down. It's telling me how much time we have left in the session. Yes, okay, great. I was confused for a second. Second thing, it's time to change the conversation. So this was a release from about last October from uh, HHS on HIPAA and cloud computing. The question of, oh, will the government get mad at us if we put data in the cloud anymore? The answer to that is no. This guidance exists, you can go look it up online on a government, government website, you can read it. It has very specific, very helpful guidance for how to engage effectively with a cloud service provider. And my recommendation is that you stop talking about this like, gee, I don't know if we can do this in the cloud, but the fact is the advantages are so strong that the conversation needs to be, how quickly can we get there? A little repeat from some of what Joe talked about. Recognize that in terms of security, there is a joint responsibility. Google 
owns physical infrastructure, platform, and software as a service level security, you still own everything top to bottom. And this is important, again, in this battle for hearts and minds, because you have your security and compliance officers. They need to have confidence that you know what you are talking about. And the moment you go in and say, oh, we're going to move this to Google, and they're going to take care of security, they will know that you don't know what you're talking about. You have a responsibility to understand what your responsibility is, and you need to be able to speak this language. You need to understand what it really means to be HIPAA compliant. You don't need to understand how encryption algorithms work, but you need to understand where the responsibilities lie and the difference between technical security and organizational level controls, and to be able to define, here's what we're gonna get from Google and here's what we're gonna have to do ourselves. If you can't speak that language, find somebody who can and get them to help you, get them on your side and have them help you to advocate for the security of the cloud. Here's another way to do it. This is Fort Knox. Uh, Google Legal made me go back and get a non-copyrighted photo of Fort Knox. <laughs> Google has built Fort Knox in their data center. It is literally true that the South Carolina data center has alligators on the property. Not as a formal part of the security mechanism, but they sort of moved in and Google said, that's fine, we'll leave them there. And they put up some beware of alligator signs and it's gonna help. How many of you have alligators outside your data center? <laughs> Not many. You still have this responsibility. You can build the strongest vault in the world. If you leave it unlocked, you're going to have problems, right? So your, those orange bars, your responsibility. Um, again, what Google does, what we do, Joe already talked about all of the different compliance and certifications. Uh, my HIPAA with the asterisk here, just to repeat what he said, there is no HIPAA certification. If somebody tells you that they have one, they're lying. What they have is a, maybe a third party auditor who said, yeah, we think that this is HIPAA compliant, but the government hasn't set a, a checkbox way to say that you're HIPAA compliant, so there's some judgment that you've got to take there. It's gonna feel like you're never done. That's fine, sleep is for mortals. Um, Recognize that, that Google is, I'll be honest, one of the things that brought comfort to our uh, legal folks was recognizing that in the event of a breach that was Google's fault, Google's got a lot of resources that in the event of a lawsuit, we're confident they could probably cover our expenses, right, if that had to happen. We hope that never happens. But there is work here for you to do as well. Map those various compliance certifications to whatever requirements your organization has. If you want to throw independent pen testers at it to make people comfortable, do that. In fact, one of the early things that, that we were, that, that sort of said, wow, I think we're going down the right path is, is again, I asked Doug Daniels, I said, so if we wanted to, to have our, you know, in-house white hat hackers go after this thing and try to, you know, penetrate BigQuery or something like that, could they do that or would we get in trouble? And he's like, go for it, right? Because Google is doing this always themselves. They're giving out money to people who are, who are trying to hack their system. You can build hybrid monitoring and alerting systems if you have local systems, if you're using Splunk or Nagios or other systems that your um, security people are comfortable with, fine, let them have those things and, and build mechanisms that allow them to use sort of hybrid approaches to uh, monitoring and alerting and watch the contracts. So I was gonna make a whole slide, but there's probably another hour on, on making sure that your contracts are unambiguous and appropriate liabilities are set up. Finally, to the innovation point, please think beyond the lift and shift, let's get our virtual machines out of our data center and onto Google. There have been a, a lot of discussions here and in the keynotes about how you do this kind of incrementally. Um, fine to take an incremental approach, but don't get your VMs out of your data center and into Google's and consider yourself done because the greatest gains are to be had in the cloud 2.0, cloud 3.0, thinking beyond virtual machines and into SaaS and PaaS offerings. So here's one. A couple of super smart guys um, on, on my team here work together to see hey, we've, we've got a, every time we do a data load, we have to take these six million patient records and do this big fuzzy match cross join. We want to find out if Bobby Peterson at the children's hospital is the same as Roberta Peterson at the adult hospital with 10 year apart visits. That's a tricky problem. It's a huge computational challenge. 
And any of you who operate systems like this, you know it's not a small, uh, not a small effort. Our legacy system had an expensive uh, uh, application and server that this ran on, and to do that six million record fuzzy cross-join took about eight hours. They re-implemented this in BigQuery, using BigQuery's user-defined functions, using JavaScript in order to, to do the fuzzy matching, ran it, and it finished in about 15 minutes, and it cost us about a buck 50 every time we run it in terms of, of BigQuery computational power. That is the kind of win that you can get when you look beyond just moving your virtual machines into the, into the sky and say, what can we do with some of these scalable, serverless um, tools that are out there? What could you do if suddenly you didn't have to keep asking, do we have enough storage space? Do we have enough compute power? What could you do with zero depth entry? That six month pilot started in about March. In about June, my wife came upstairs and said, why do we have a multi-thousand dollar bill to Google on our personal credit card? <laughs> because back in March, I sat in my couch, on my couch, in my pajamas, and signed up for our Google account on my personal credit card and didn't notice it for three months because as we were starting to load data in and work with the system in this stealth mode project, the, the costs were negligible. And it wasn't until we started deploying lots of data and lots of virtual machines that it even sort of hit, hit the radar on the credit card bill. Don't do that. <laughs> Google Legal doesn't make it easy to get that back, but they, we did get it back. Thank you again, Doug Daniels, and, and apologies to my wife. So we got that done. But the point is the fact that you can make that mistake accidentally certainly means that you won't need CFO authorization and a big CapEx spend in order to start playing around, right? I think everybody here has got a $300 credit. I think they've extended the, the period from six months to 12 months for the, for the trial period. Get in and start with this zero depth entry approach, seeing what you can do. Think about cloud first architectures, right? So we're taking our data, we're pushing it into the cloud unchanged and we're doing all the work there. What could you do if people could get to your data from all over the region or all over the world? What can you do with the integration between your data in the cloud and these amazing cloud-based analytical tools that are out there? And given, given that you will hopefully save money, what do you do with that? You take that money, you don't give it back, and you redirect that toward value-added activities. For us, that means hiring more analysts, bringing in more data sources, working on improving our customer relationship management approaches and building a better organization that is much more focused on delivering value. I'm not gonna repeat all this, this is summarizing what we just said. You've got to build the business case, you've gotta make sure that you can speak to the security and you've gotta focus on innovation. Um, that's all I had by way of information. I, I wanted to give some thank yous to the folks on the screen here who really helped us in building these things out, figuring out our security approaches, helping us with processes, architecture design. Huge thanks to my team, most of whom are here and who, who really were the hands-on doing this work. Um, and let me just ask Joe, do we have time? Do we want to hit that demo? We've got 12 minutes left on here. Yeah. Okay. So we just want to prove that we're not, we're not making stuff up here. Here's our, here's our Twitter handle if you want to follow us. We don't tweet a lot, but there's stuff there. Maybe we'll make friends. Um, a couple of, of, of uh, screenshots and then a running demo, if it works, of actual things that we have actually built. Here is a dashboard in Tableau that shows top 10 disease diagnoses for uh, one of our hospital systems with lots of information about the distribution across sex and race, comorbidities, distribution over patient age. And the fun thing is you can click down on that list and you can uh, see this refresh and the numbers change, scanning 133 million diagnosis records, and it refreshes and does all that recalculating in about 10 seconds. Here's a static copy of the thing I'm going to show you that, that uh, tells us a little bit about how the flu is spreading in the Denver metro area year over year and time over time, and I'm told that for this to work, I have to come click on this. This works right, that moves. Check it out, this is in Tableau. And you can see on the left in that map, 
those dots are our various clinics, and we're seeing the rate at which the flu is spreading, and we're comparing that year over year with each of those columns on the right. Again, kudos to, to, to my team and to our great uh, BI developers and analysts who figured out how to put this thing together. We're gonna let that flow for just a minute because at the end, something really cool happens. Um, uh, part of, one of the sort of unexpected side benefits of moving to Google BigQuery is being able to take advantage of Google's efforts to bring public data sets into BigQuery. And for those of you who haven't worked with BigQuery, the interesting thing is it's sort of like one great big shared DBMS. You have data, other people have data, and assuming that the permissions are set correctly, you can join across to different data sets with literally one join statement in your SQL command. So you'll see this thing come to the end of its um, period here in just a minute. Look at that big spike in 2014. The scientists got the flu vaccine wrong that year, and we're a little bit nervous about what 2016 is looking like. But now just to, to see what's possible here, the magical mouse is gonna move up, click a button, and we're gonna color code those trends on the top according to weather. So that is blue when it's cold and red when it's warm. And that data was brought in almost instantly with one join to a public data set from Google that talks about uh, daily weather station data. So um, we build real stuff with this. And that's all I have. So thank you. All right, I'm gonna go through this last part pretty quickly because I wanna make sure we uh, have time for Phil to join us on stage. So in addition to Google Cloud Platform, G Suite is a, a popular tool uh, in the healthcare business to provide secure productivity tools to help you help others. I've always enjoyed this quote here about G Suite uh, from Roche, and it was actually, I think the original quote says apps because that was when they adopted it before it was called G Suite saying G Suite will allow our employees to focus on what matters most, saving patient lives. Much like I talked about earlier, HIPAA compliance guides, we also have one for G Suite. If you go to the G Suite site, you can get that information there on how to properly configure that environment to bring PHI to the cloud for use in these productivity tools. And with that, I wanted to invite Phil back up to talk about the work that Veritas is doing to help customers with their G Suite in healthcare. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Phil Yusino with Veritas. Uh, what Veritas is able to provide for G Suite is really a software as a service product that helps you move to the cloud and helps you be compliant with, with HIPAA regulations. So what we, able are, what we do essentially is provide a, uh, a, a compliant repository for your mail data. So your Gmail uh, information that comes, with, comes to you, it gets brought into our ev.cloud product. ev.cloud makes what we refer to as an immutable copy. So you can't be, it can't be deleted, it can't be altered, it can't be changed. What we're then able to do is provide a workflow that allows you to do search and uh, production for legal matters or compliance matters. So if you have uh, needs to prove uh, that there's uh, data of, of, that has user-based information in it or, or patient-based information, you can search for that and output that to, for, the need, for the need that you have. Additionally, you can also do the same thing for court matters. So it gives a lot of flexibility and it's all within an audited process. So you're able to have chain of custody, you have uh, legal discovery, and also uh, be able to respond for requests for patient data as well. So it gives you those, covers those three areas and allows your HIPAA compliance at the same time. So, and really that's, that's the, the goal. It allow you, allows you to simplify your, your workflows, it allows you to uh, meet regulatory and legal compliance and able to improve your both IT infrastructure and also your e-discovery productivity as well. So basically what we're able to do is a better together scenario, be able to uh, improve what G Suite already has in place and give you a product that allows you to be compliant with regula regulatory needs. <laughs> 